Okay, welcome to the third lecture in the hottest summer school. If you're disappointed to see me hosting again, I have good news for you. Next week, we will have a new host who's someone who plays an important role in the school, and you should tune in to see who it is. If you're watching on YouTube, I recommend that you consider attending live next time by joining us on Zoom. And also, you could like and subscribe. All right, so today we have Paige North, who will be giving her second lecture on homotopy type theory. Please go ahead. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, it's great to be back. It's great to see the enthusiasm that um, all the participants are showing on um, the Discord. So today I want to start by um, just be clear about where we are and where we're going. So last time we talked about the structure of dependent type theory, which we will see repeated over and over again in this lecture, of course, because we're going to be using dependent type theory. And we also saw uh, pi implication or function and product or conjunction types. And these, um, if you want to see more details than I presented in my lecture, I would recommend that you look at uh, Egbert Reika's book, sections one and two, that's what we're following. Okay, this time, we're going to be talking about uh, inductive types, so more type formers that allow us to do more math. And this is covered in sections three and four of Reika's book. And next time, we're going to be um, looking at the most interesting and unusual inductive type, which is to say the identity type. And this is um, covered in section five of Egbert's book. Okay, so in this lecture, we're gonna be doing um, the inductive types, all the inductive types or the most important inductive types without the identity type. So we're still firmly in the land of just dependent type theory. But once we introduce the identity type, which will only happen in the next lecture, then we will finally get into the world of homotopies. So only next time will we start to get into proper homotopy type theory and not just type theory. Okay, so let's start. Uh, so all these things that we're going to be talking about, the inductive types, the identity type, and the, um, as we talked about last time, pi implication and conjunction types, we uh, can call them types, I guess, for short, but a better name is type formers. And that's because we uh, are using the rules that define them to form types. Okay, so the rules that define pi implication, this uh, product and conjunction type, which we learned last time is the same, uh, inductive types, including identity types. These are called type formers. Okay, and the reason I want to um, point this out is to, I want to make clear kind of what the business of type theory is. So when we uh, study a type theory, when we use a type theory, we're perfectly free to choose which type formers we include in our type theory. So we can choose the type formers that we want for whatever purpose we have as when we're just doing type theory. But when people say hot homotopy type theory, uh, so when people say hot, they might mean a research program, but if they mean hot as a type theory, uh, it, they usually mean dependent type theory, which we've been talking about. Uh, plus all the type formers that we're going to introduce in this course, which is why we're, uh, we've chosen those particular ones to introduce. So plus all the type formers in this course. and plus uh, a very special axiom, which we will only see in a few lectures from now. 
Okay, so in general, we're just doing hot. You can choose whichever one of these type formers you like, or you can make up new ones. Sorry, uh, let me start that over. When you're doing type theory, you can choose whichever type formers you want, or you can make up new ones. But when we're doing hot, we usually need a specific set of type formers, and those are the ones that we're learning about. Okay, let me um, now compare the situation in type theory with uh, zermelo frankel set theory. So, I want to point out what is different between um, doing mathematics and type theory and doing mathematics as you might have learned it if you started um, studying mathematics uh, in a traditional university. So uh, when we do set theory, so I'm talking about uh, zermelo frankel set theory to just to be a little bit precise. So in zermelo frankel set theory, um, we encode all the things that um, we're going to be talking about in this lecture as type formers. We encode things like products, functions, uh, other things. So products, functions, other things are encoded in, uh, in the set theory in a rather complicated way. And what this means is that the practice of mathematics, what we actually do when we you know, solve our problem sets or do research, the actual practice of mathematics is far away from the foundations. Unless, of course, you're doing a problem set or research on foundations. Um, and in contrast to this, when we do type theory, we postulate, we just assume the existence of things like products, functions, etc. And in this way, the practice of mathematics is much closer to the foundations because as part of the foundations, we're just postulating that we have products that behave in the reasonable way. And so when we use products, we're much closer to the foundation. Okay, so in type theory, mathematics is closer to the foundations. Okay, so there's a little bit, a little spiel about what type formers are, uh, how they make math and type theory a bit different than in set theory. And in this lecture, we're going to be talking about inductive types as I advertise. So inductive types, uh, I would say, I mean, we're gonna see um, precisely the pattern that their definitions follow, but if I can just say that pattern um, in more casual language, I would say that inductive types are freely generated by their canonical terms. Okay, and we'll see precisely what this means. So this is kind of a, a casual definition of the term inductive types. Okay, so for example, um, we're gonna talk about this example in depth in the kind of pen and paper homotopy type theory or just type theory for now. But those of you who were at the Agda lecture on Wednesday already saw the Booleans. And hopefully you um, got a good feel for the Booleans and you understood that the Booleans are freely generated by their canonical elements. I don't think that term was used by our team, but I'm going to use it. Uh, so by their canonical elements, or maybe I should better say canonical terms. And those were the two terms, true and false. OK, so what does this look like in Agda? So again, I'm just using this, hopefully people attended the lecture on Wednesday, and I just want to compare and contrast what we're doing today with what happened on Wednesday. Uh, if you haven't seen that, then don't worry, we're gonna kind of redo this um, on pen and paper in a second. But for those of you who saw the lecture on Wednesday, uh, I'm going to write out some code here. This is a bit strange. So the Booleans were defined like this, data Boolean type, where true, false 
is in bool. And so this um, piece of syntax in Agda tells Agda that to define a dependent function out of the Booleans, it suffices to define it just on its canonical elements, which here are these, these guys, true and false. Okay, so in general, if we write something like this in Agda, this kind of syntax tells uh, Agda that you're defining an inductive type. So this, uh, this tells Agda we're defining an inductive type. But when we do pen and paper um, type theory, uh, you certainly could do something like this, but it's more normal to define um, define the inductive type with this kind of information, but add in extra information, the extra information you need to uh, really say that it's freely generated by these canonical elements, for example, true and false. Okay, so let's um, define the booleans on pen and paper and maybe we'll see uh, how exactly it differs from doing an agda. Okay. Um, Paige. Uh, there's yes. a question that I think would be yes. good here. Um, there, what does freely mean? Yeah, okay. So I want to say that this uh, definition, inductive types are freely generated by their canonical terms, doesn't have a precise meaning except for maybe the pattern that will emerge after I've actually defined a bunch of inductive types. Uh, I just want to give some kind of intuition. Okay, but the intuition is that there's uh, kind of nothing else in the type or um, in some sense, the let's say the behavior of the type as it interacts with other types in the world is completely determined by its behavior on its canonical elements. So in that kind of sense, you can only kind of detect uh, the terms or the elements by looking at the behavior of the type. It doesn't have any other uh, terms than the canonical ones. Okay, right, good question. So now let's see something more precise than that um, casual definition I gave. Let's see how we define the booleans in pen and paper type theory, not just in, uh, in Agda. Okay, so just like the type formers uh, that we studied last time on Monday, pi types, dependent product types, uh, function types, and conjunction slash product types, we have four rules that are going to define all of these uh, type formers. And they have the, the same, roughly the same names. So the first one is the formation rule. And this just says, if you remember um, the pattern that we saw on Monday, this just says that the type that we're looking at is a type. So it's something that we can look at. So the Booleans start with this rule, which says that Without any hypotheses, remember when we write a rule like this, the things above this horizontal line are the hypotheses, and the things below the horizontal lines are the things that we're allowed to conclude from the hypotheses. So this rule says that without any particular hypotheses, we can conclude that the Booleans are a type. Okay, so we're just always allowed to conclude that the Booleans are a type. It's always a type. We don't have to um, produce anything special. There's nothing that we have to uh, produce to get Booleans. And I also want to remind everyone what this symbol means, this turnstile. It means that the Booleans or whatever is to the right of the turnstile depends on the hypotheses that we're making to the left of the turnstile, right? And so here there, there's nothing to the left of the turnstile. So again, we don't need any hypotheses. So just the Booleans are a type, nothing, nothing needed to say that. Okay, uh, so we know the Booleans are a type, but what exactly are they? So first of all, or second of all, we have the second rule, um, the introduction rule for the Booleans. And if you remember back to uh, the dependent product types and all those other ones on Monday, the introduction rule always uh, specifies the elements that we know about, or the terms that we know about in the types. And so these are the canonical elements. So the canonical elements are always the ones introduced in this introduction rule. So, we have two canonical elements, as we just saw. So again, without any hypotheses, 
we're just going to postulate that there's an element true in the booleans and similarly that there's an element false in the booleans so these are the canonical elements this guy oops maybe i should point actually there's elements this guy false and this guy true these are the canonical elements of bool because they're being introduced in the introduction rule. Okay, maybe I should make my arrows a, a bit smaller so I can fit more on the page. There we go. Okay. Right. So now we have the first two rules saying that booleans are a type, saying what's in the booleans. And let's uh, remember what we wrote in Agda. So that's basically all that we wrote, all that's needed in Agda when you use this kind of syntax in Agda. So the first line here says that the booleans are a type, and the second line says what the canonical elements are in the booleans. Okay, and then Agda just knows, uh, since you're using that particular kind of syntax that we want is an inductive type and it just kind of generates the rest. But when we do pen and paper type theory, we usually write down the rest by hand. Okay, so we have two more rules um, following the pattern that we saw on Monday. So we have an elimination rule, first of all, and then we're gonna have a computation rule. Okay, so the elimination rule uh, is going to look a little bit different than the ones that we saw in the last lecture on Monday, but they all have the same pattern. Okay, so let's maybe write out this this rule for the booleans, and then I'll point out what the pattern is, and then we'll see it as we um, as we see more and more type formers. Okay, so this rule has three hypotheses. The first is that we have a dependent type. Basically, we want to just imagine it really being dependent on the booleans. And perhaps we need some extra hypotheses. Uh, maybe like we have something interesting going on. So there are some extra hypotheses being floating, uh, floating around. But what we want to imagine is that we have some dependent type on the booleans. And I think it's uh, instructive in this kind of, in these rules, to think of this dependent type as being a predicate on the booleans. We can think of D as being some statement about the particular Boolean X. Okay, so if we have some dependent type or some predicate on the booleans, uh, this rule, maybe I should give you the conclusion first, is going to tell us how to get something, how to get a term in D of X. Okay, so if we're thinking about D of X as being a predicate on the boolean, this rule is telling us how to get a term of it, how to get a proof of it, so how to prove um, that the predicate holds for all booleans. Okay, so what do we need to supply to prove this predicate D for all the booleans? Well, since the booleans just consist of true and false, hopefully it seems reasonable that we just have to supply a true uh, a proof when we're looking at the case that X is true, like X is equals the element true. And we have to supply a proof of D when we're looking at uh, X being false element false okay so that's exactly what is involved in this rule so again we, we carry around these hypotheses that we're maybe making and we ask that there's some witness that we can produce of the predicate d applied to true and similarly for false okay so if we can prove the statement in the case that we're looking at true and in the case that we're looking at false, then the rule says, uh, oops, let me write this the way that it happened. The rule says that indeed we get a proof uh, that D of X holds for any X from these, these two proofs, A and B. Okay, so that's the elimination rule. And then we have a computation rule and the computation rule just says that uh, this, this proof that we have now for every x, if we plug in true or false into that proof that's just for every x, then it produces the proof that we started with. Okay, so let me write that down. So we can zoom out a bit so we can see everything at once. Uh, all right, so the computation rule, it has the same hypotheses as the elimination rule. So we'll just copy and paste that. And the conclusion is now that 
if we take this proof of d of x for an arbitrary x, but we apply it to the case when x is uh, true, then we should get back this piece of data that we started with the proof that this predicate holds at true. And we have the same statement for false. This should be B and D of false. Okay, so uh, we don't, with these rules, we don't explicitly postulate some statement that says that true and false are the only uh, terms in the Booleans. But they are kind of all that really matters in the Booleans in the sense that to, to prove a predicate about the Booleans like this, it just suffices to prove it in the two cases that the Boolean you're looking at is true or false. Then we get a proof for any Boolean. And if we uh, apply that new proof, we look at the value of that new proof or what that proof actually amounts to uh, in the case that we're looking at true or false, then it's the original proof that we provided. Okay, so let's now look at an example. And uh, this is the example that Martin did. So I hope it will be instructive to see it worked out in both uh, ways of working with type theory. So suppose we want to make a function from bool to bool that switches true and false. We can call this not. So how does that work? Okay, so let's uh, build a proof tree very uh, slowly. So first of all, we want a what a function from bool to bool. The, I mean, I'm calling in the problem statement, I'm calling this function not, but we're gonna build it up and then see that it's, uh, it's gonna be a very long term that's built up out of all sorts of rules for different type formers. And uh, so we'll have a very long and complicated name, which we can then just kind of rename not if we want to. Okay, so there's a question mark there standing for what exactly the function is that we're gonna produce from bool to bool. Okay, now let's remember quickly, hopefully, remember, uh, but in case not, let's uh, recall the introduction rule for implication. So if we wanna produce uh, a morphism, a function, I should say, from P to Q, the introduction rule for implication tells us that we need this kind of hypothesis, and then we get a function that we usually call lambda x dot Q. Okay. So we want a function here in this problem. We want a function from bool to bool. So the only way to produce a function is to use the function introduction rule. And so we apply that in this case, and we find that the kind of hypothesis that we need to produce a function looks like this. So we need some guy in bool that has a hypothesis, and then from that, another guy in bool, that should hopefully be, be the opposite. Okay, and now we're looking at producing, um, well, something, something of this shape. And this is exactly, let me make this a bit smaller so we can see a bit more. This is exactly the kind of thing that this rule tells us how to do. Right? This rule tells us how to produce a judgment of this form. Okay, so just pattern matching here. The gamma is empty. So the gamma is just uh, empty in this particular case that we're looking at. And this D of X is going to be bool no matter what X is. So we're just looking at the constant type family, D of X, okay? And then we need to uh, produce all of these uh, hypotheses in order to conclude this. Okay, so again, we're, we're working backwards. So we need to produce these hypotheses, these three hypotheses, okay? So the first one is, uh, that we have a dependent type on the Booleans, this D. And I said that it's going to be um, bool. The second one says what the function should basically be when we plug in true. And we're defining not, so we want it to be false. So the second, uh, the second argument here, the second hypothesis that we need to apply this rule is going to be uh, the value false 
in the Boolean. And the third, the third argument that we need to supply is what we want the value of this function at false to be. We want it to be true. So we put a true here. And with these three hypotheses, we get uh, the conclusion, which now we know how to write. Uh, we can write it as in bool. Uh, I think I need more space here. End bool false true x in bool. Okay, so now we have this uh, this term that takes in an x in the booleans and produces this thing in bool false true x, which is also in the booleans. Okay, and if we uh, use the computation rule to understand what it does, well, it does exactly what we encoded it to do. It takes uh, true to false and false to true. All right, and now we have to um, figure out what the last uh, question mark is. So we have to apply now actually the um, implication introduction rule. And to do this, we're going to abstract X from this term. Let's see. Okay, almost. Okay, so we just abstract X from that term and we obtain a function from bool to bool. Okay, and like I said, the um, eliminate or the computation rule for the Booleans tells us how the whole thing behaves at this point. If X is true, it returns false. And if X is false, it returns true. And the computation rule for the for implication tells us how this thing behaves uh, as a function. If you put in true, it returns false and vice versa. Okay, so that's uh, one simple example of how to um, use the type formers, the, all the rules for the inductive type Boolean to produce a function from bool to bool. Okay, so now let's talk about um, another inductive type. Let's talk about coproducts. Uh, so we write coproducts usually with a plus. And these again have four rules. So we have uh, coproduct formation rule, first of all. And this tells us that if we have, maybe I want a hypothesis, if we have a type P, maybe we need some hypotheses to build up P. But if we have a, a type P and a type Q, perhaps with the same hypotheses, then with those hypotheses, we can obtain a type P plus Q. We uh, view this as the co-product type of P and Q. Okay, so that's the formation rule tells us the type exists. Now the introduction rule tells us what the um, canonical elements are in this type. So if we have using the um, hypotheses that we're maybe making, if we have a particular uh, term in P, little p, then we should certainly, I mean, if we're already have some intuition about this based on the notation and the name co-product, uh, maybe it should kind of be looking like a union of P and Q. So if we have a, a term of P, then we're gonna have a term of P plus Q. And we are gonna call this term in left of P in P plus Q. So if we have a term in P, we can kind of send it using in left to the canonical term in left of P. And of course, similarly, if we have a term of Q, then uh, we can use this canonical term in right of Q to view it as a term of P plus Q. Okay, so again, this is maybe all you need if you already know that we're following the pattern of a inductive type, but we're still gonna write down the elimination and computation rules that um, govern how it's gonna behave. So uh, once you get the hang of inductive types, you should be able to just generate yourself as a person, or maybe if you're Agda, you can also generate the elimination and computation rules just from what I've uh, already written here. Um, I mean, it's a bit early in this lecture, but maybe already be thinking 
by yourself about what those would be as I as I'm writing them down. See if see if you uh, can guess what they should be. Okay, so the elimination rule says that if we have a type dependent on a uh, co-product type, then uh, well, the elimination rule is going to tell us how to prove. Like if we're thinking again about uh, d of x as a predicate, it's going to tell us how to prove d of x, how to produce a term of d of x. Okay, so let's maybe write down the conclusion here. So what we want to know is how to prove d of x for every x. Okay, and just like the Boolean, since we have these canonical elements now, not just two, but you know, however many things are in B and however many things are in Q, we have all of those guys. Uh, to prove D of X for all X, it suffices to prove it on the canonical elements. That's the pattern. And so here it suffices to prove it on all things of the form in left of P and all things of the form in left of Q. So we're going to have two hypotheses corresponding to these. So first of all, if we've got a P, and we can produce uh, a proof of the predicate D at a thing like in left of P, then we're halfway there. And if we also know that for any Q, we can produce a proof of this predicate D at in left of Q, then we can produce a proof of this predicate D always. So I'm going to need more room here. So we call this IND. I don't know if I said it when we, I was writing this down for the Booleans, but IND stands for induction, right? Or inductive type. OK, so IND, here we're doing IND of the co-product type, taking in the information of A and B. And it's also going to be taking in the X that's to the left and uh, producing a proof IND plus ABX of D of X. So for every x. OK, and then the computation rules are also following this pattern. So the computation rules, they um, use the same hypotheses, or always use the same hypotheses for, for these inductive types. They always use the same hypotheses as the elimination rule does. So maybe I will stop writing the hypotheses down again. I'm just going to write the conclusion of the computation rule. Uh, or maybe I'll just write it in words. So same hypotheses as plus a limb. And with these same hypotheses, uh, the computation rule should tell us that if we plug into uh, this x here, something of the form in left p or in right of q, I don't know if you're seeing that I have a typo here, here. It said in left of P and instead of, or in left of Q and instead of said in right of Q. Okay, so if we plug in for this X something of the form in left of P or in right of Q, then we should get back the original piece of data that we provided, the original proof that D holds in in those cases. Okay, so if we have a P and we plug that P in modulated by this piece of um, syntax in left to the induction uh, term in plus, then this should be exactly the same as A. And similarly for Q. So if we plug in Q and right of Q, that should be the same as the original proof B that D holds there. OK, so those are the, the four rules um, for the co-products. And now, uh, well, before we stop talking about this, is there some room here? Uh, so let's uh, talk about this quickly maybe without leaving this page, and then I'll write it down. So uh, we're talking about co-products here, and hopefully the intuition that you're getting from the word co-product or the plus or just the rules is that this behaves a lot like union of sets. So we saw in the last lecture, my last lecture on Monday, that there's a set interpretation where we can view every type as a set. 
and every term as a uh, element of the set. And so these rules for the coproducts are telling us that it's exactly what we uh, expect for a disjoint union of two sets, right? So if we have something in P, then there's something in that, that disjoint union of P plus Q, similarly for Q. And uh, here, oops, here in these rules, we're uh, expressing the idea that P plus Q behaves as if um, the only things in P, in P plus Q are coming from P or Q. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you that in the set interpretation, plus behaves like a disjoint union of two sets. And now we also have to figure out what this looks like or what this uh, means in the logical interpretation. So of course I've already been using this lecture, but remember that there's a logical interpretation where every type we think of as a um, proposition, is a dependent type, we think of it as a predicate, and a, a term we think of as a proof. Okay, so in the logical interpretation, let's think about what's happening here. So the logical interpretation of this introduction rule is first of all saying that if we have a proof of P, then we have a proof of P plus Q. And also if we have a proof of Q, then we have a proof of P plus Q. Okay, so hopefully it's already starting to look like a disjunction or or, right? You can prove a proposition P or Q if you can prove P or you can prove Q. And the elimination rule has a very nice um, interpretation because it's saying that if you want to prove, let's say you want to prove this predicate D that now is on a, what we're, what I'm trying to explain is a disjunction, um, then it suffices to prove it on P or on Q, which is to say that we uh, can do a proof by cases. Okay, so if we want to prove um, a predicate on a disjunction, we just have to do a proof by cases. We just have to do a proof where we're assuming P or and the proof where we're um, assuming Q. Okay, so in that way, hopefully I've convinced you that in the logical interpretation, this um, co-product behaves like disjunction or or the connective or. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's uh, maybe think, maybe it's, well, I guess it's appropriate to think about this in either the logical or the set interpretation. So we're just uh, going to factor out something here. Um, so for any types A, B, and C, there is a function from A times B plus A times C to A times B plus C. Okay, so we're talking about times the product. I'm now using the simple times. So maybe I should be clear and say that times is the same. Uh, now I'm not sure which symbol for equality I should use. Time, by times I mean uh, the same thing as the conjunction that we talked about last time. Uh, okay, and maybe I should say something about the order of operations here. So the times is the um, tightest binder, then plus, then implication. So if I were to put um, parentheses around everything, I would do this. Oops, I wanted to do this here. Like this. Okay, so let's prove this statement. So again, we're gonna kind of go, go backwards. So starting from what we wanna prove, we're going to Think about the form of the thing we want to prove and backtrack to um, all the hypotheses that we need. So I uh, probably need more room here. So let's say we want to, or you know, that we want to prove uh, this function, the existence of this function. Okay, so again, just like before, we want to prove um, or want to construct a function or want to prove an implication. So the way we do this is by using the implication introduction rule that's 
really the only way to prove an implication. And that says that we have to assume some witness of the domain and try to produce from that the proof of the codomain. Okay, so we want something like this. And now we see that we want to prove something uh, whose hypothesis is a coproduct. So let's look back now at the, um, the elimination rule here. So remember that this is telling us that we want to, maybe I can copy and paste this actually. Let's see, I'll put it here, very small, but hopefully we can see. Um, so we want to, we want to prove something, of, oops, we want to prove something of this form, which matches up with this form, right? It's something being proven or a function being proven out of, being constructed out of a co-product. Okay, so what we have to supply are um, these three hypotheses. Okay, so just the, again, pattern matching, we see that we pattern match this guy with this guy. We see that the gamma is just uh, empty. There are no extra hypotheses that we wanna put into gamma. And this guy D of X is always going to be A times D plus C for any X. So it's a, a constant type family. Okay, so we already know what, what this is. It's going to say that for any X in, in this thing, we're looking at the type for D of X, we're looking at this type. Okay, I'm not gonna write down that hypothesis now explicitly. I'm just gonna write down the two hypotheses um, corresponding to these two guys. Okay, so this, the first one, says that, okay, we should look at the first part of the uh, disjunction or the first part of this coproduct, which is A times D. And we want to produce something in A times D plus D. I think I'm gonna need more room. Let me just erase all of this here so I have lots of room. Uh, okay, so we need to produce something in A times B plus C. Now, how do we do that? Okay, so remember, that I could write actually a whole proof tree for this, but I'm not gonna do it because uh, there would be a lot of writing. But remember from last time that if we have a proof here, I'm calling it X1 of A times B, we can uh, obtain from that a proof or a term PR X, PR1 X1 of A and PR, uh, PR2 X1 of B. So let me maybe just make a little note of that. So from this, we can get PR1 X1 in A, and PR2, X1, and B. Okay, and to produce something in a product, we could use this pairing operation. Right? So we need something in A, and we need something in B plus C, and we just have to pair them. Okay, so I'm just gonna write this down. So the first thing we need is something in A, which we do have. We have this guy as something in A, and now we need something in B plus C. And we have something in B, that's the PR2 X1. And we can use in left to put it into B plus C. So we have in left PR2 X1. Okay, so that is the first hypothesis. Let me move this up here and write them one under the other. Okay, so that's the first hypothesis done corresponding to this guy. And now we have to prove this guy. So we have to start with the assumption that we have something in the second part of the coproduct, which here is A times C. And we have to uh, prove something in this D, which is always A times B plus C. And it's going to look relatively similar, right? Because we have almost the same thing. So we first of all want to, uh, so we're going to have a pair again. And the first part of the pair is going to be something in A. So it's again going to be the first projection of um, our assumption, X2. And we want uh, now something in B plus C. We can get something in C, and then we can put it into B plus C using in right, the canonical element of our, uh, dis uh, our disjunction, our coproduct. Okay, so in right of PR2, X2 is going to be in the type 
B plus C. So we put them together in this pair and we get something in the product A times B plus C. Okay, now with all of that uh, done, we can now apply the elimination rule and get the kind of term that we want. And it's gonna be very long to write out. That's gonna look like in the plus, maybe I won't write it out, write everything out, but it's gonna be um, these two arguments and then an X where these two arguments that I'm not writing out are these two guys. Okay, and then for the last step, we wanna remember how to go from a judgment of this type to an actual function. Well, we just do lambda abstraction. So we're just gonna abstract lambda from this term, which was something long, something long, and x. Okay, and that's how we produce a function like that. Okay, maybe I should ask if there are any questions right now. It's been relatively silent on the other end. I don't see anything popping up in the Q and A or the chat right now. There have been lots of questions that the TAs have been handling. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're going to come to something maybe slightly more interesting and more complicated, which is dependent pair types. Uh, so these are usually called sigma, and uh, the, the actual like English name that you might say. Uh, there are many choices. So you could say dependent pair types, and I just want to write down here so we could call them also dependent sum, or maybe even coproduct. I don't know if I've ever heard that before. Types, because they uh, generalize the coproducts that we just talked about. And maybe what's most common when people are talking quickly is to just call them uh, sigma types, just reading out the, the symbol. Okay, so these are relatively similar in some sense to the pi types that we talked about last time, the dependent product types or dependent function types. So let's look at some examples to motivate why um, we would be interested in these kinds of things. So uh, I had this example before of a um, nice dependent type. So let's say again that for every natural number n, which we haven't defined yet, but we will in a second, we have somehow already constructed, because we all were more advanced, we've read more of Hyper Reiter's book than um, we really have at the moment. We managed to construct a type vect n of vectors of length n. Okay, so we've got lists at every n, we've got the, the type of list, the collection of lists of length n. Okay, so we learned about, uh, or I talked about this, pi type, which was the collection of things that kind of look like functions, really dependent functions from the natural numbers into vect n. Right? And we had this example, uh, zero n from, or maybe I should just call it zero, from pi and then uh, to vect n. So we talked about uh, zero as being a function from the natural numbers into the collection of all vectors that takes a natural number n to the vector of length n, which just has zeros everywhere. And we can encode that uh, for every n, it doesn't just, the result of this function doesn't just land in the collection of all vectors, but it lands in the um, collection of vectors just of length n. We can kind of encode that information in this kind of dependent function type. Okay, so that's uh, one, that if we start out with a, a dependent type, one, uh, very natural, maybe it doesn't seem so natural at first, but once you start working with these things, one very natural thing to do is to want to form the pi type. But there's a kind of opposite sort of thing that you can do in, in some technical sense, which I won't explain. I won't explain in what sense it's opposite, but we can also form another type. Like this, we can take the sigma types, which is with the same kind of thing, a dependent type. We can take either the pi type or the sigma type. 
And this behaves like a union. Like a disjoint union in the set interpretation. So as a type theorist, I would regard this sigma type as being the type or the collection of all vectors of any length, of any, I guess, finite length. So before um, on Monday, I talked about just vect all the, all the vectors of any finite length. And if I were starting with the type spec n, this is how I would produce that type. I would just take a kind of union of all the vect n's, which I um, do as a type theorist by taking a sigma type. Okay, here's another example. Uh, we could have as a more logical example, you could have a predicate is prime of n, which is saying that um, any natural number is prime. Okay, so again, we don't have the tools to actually build up this type yet, but we could if, um, if it were the future. Uh, so we have this dependent type. We can remark that there is no um, term of for all n and n is prime of n, right? because this would be um, a function that takes any natural number to a term or a proof, we might say, of the statement that n is prime. We're reading the, the type is prime of n to be the statement that n is prime. And of course, not, all, not every natural number is prime. So there's no term of this type. But we could take uh, a kind of union of these types um, by taking a sigma type like this. Oops, that's the last example. I want to say is prime. And this is, we can think of this, if, if we want to think about it in a set kind of way as a union, we can think of it as kind of the union of all the proofs um, that n is prime for all n. Okay, so of course this has many terms. Right? There's going to be a, at least one proof uh, for two and for three and for five. So this guy is going to have many, many terms. Okay. And uh, I think we can, maybe we haven't seen the rules for sigma types yet, but we can kind of argue that the sigma types are going to look a little bit, or we're going to see that they look a little bit like um, existence in logic. Right. So if this guy, if this guy has a term, it means that there's some n and a term of is prime of that n which is to say a proof that n is prime. So it means that there's some prime natural number. So it behaves um, like existence in logic. Okay, so that's the motivation for why we're interested in um, these sigma types, which I would say, you know, appear all over um, mathematics, but maybe not explicitly. And now let's look at um, the rules for them. Okay, so. Uh, we're looking at dependent pair types called sigma. And we have the four rules again, as always. So we have sigma formation. And like I said, this just takes a hypothesis that we've got some dependent, uh, I guess I will write it like Q of X that takes some dependent type Q dependent on P, perhaps we have these other hypotheses gamma that we need to make, that's fine. Uh, and if we have such a dependent type, then we can form the sigma type. Or we could also form the pi type with the same hypotheses, but we're not doing that right now. We're looking about um, sigma types. Okay, so that's the formation rule. We need to know what the canonical elements are. And uh, hopefully by the way that I described it, you might already have an idea. So if we have using our hypotheses that we're maybe making, if we have a particular uh, term of P, and if we then have a particular term of Q, but remember Q depends on um, big P, we have to plug in something like little, little p there. So if we have a term little p and a term little q, then we can put them together uh, as a pair. 
and get one of well, the only kind of canonical term of the sigma type. Okay, so the sigma type always sort of behaves as if it only consists of these pairs, the guy in the kind of index P and a guy in um, the Q as living over that P. Okay, so now we also have to write down the elimination and computation rules. But again, I hope you start to recognize the pattern here. Um, so this, this part is very straightforward. Once you get used to the pattern at least. So for the elimination rule, again, uh, we're supposing that we have a dependent type on our new type, something of, our, something of the form of our new type sigma type. Uh, so something like this, we have a dependent type. Maybe I'm gonna make everything slightly smaller so I can fit it in one slide. Just a minor comment page. You have two different X's in that line. Ah, thank you. Okay, that's not great. Uh, how did I take care of it before I use the Z? Thank you. Okay, maybe I want to point out that in theory, that's totally fine. <laughs> Because uh, this x, maybe it's time to start talking about binding. This x here is being bound by the sigma type. So I could, in theory, reuse it, but of course, that's not very clear if I do that. So I'm going to use a different, a different variable z. OK, so suppose we have a predicate d on a sigma type. The elimination rule is going to tell us how to prove that d always holds. And the hypotheses have to say that we're like we just need to prove it um, in the instances of our canonical elements. Okay, so a canonical element looks like this. So we've got some guy in P, some guy in uh, the Q that we get when we plug in our guy in P. And uh, if we are looking at one of these canonical elements, then we should be able to produce a, um, a proof. Okay, so if we can produce a proof A of the predicate at one of the canonical elements, then we can produce a proof at any element Z. Okay, so this is the elimination rule and the computation rule is the same as always. It says that if we plug in the stuff that we started with, we get back the stuff that we started with. So with the same hypotheses as the elimination rule, uh, the conclusion of the computation rule is that if we plug in a canonical element like pair XY, then we get back A in the type D of pair X, Y. Okay, so again, now I want to say, I already said this before we define the sigma types, but now that we actually have defined them, I want to talk about the logical interpretation. So again, if we, um, interpret every type as a, uh, well, not every type, let's say, uh, what do I want to say? So to prove sigma x and p q x. So now I want to say that for this interpretation that I'm about to explain to make sense, we want to think about p as a set and q as a predicate on that set. So, okay, not everything is being interpreted as uh, propositions and predicates, but we're interpreting q as a predicate on a set P. So to prove a, a thing like this, we have to produce a proof of Q of P for some term P of P. Okay, so in that sense, uh, our sigma type behaves like existence and logic, right? To prove that something exists, that there exists some piece such that Q of 
uh, or there exists some S and T, X and T such that Q of X holds. Uh, we have to do just what we said. We have to find one and produce proof. Okay, and in the set interpretation, uh, as I said before, the canonical elements here are pairs like this. They're pairs of the, the indexing set. If we're thinking about everything that's a set, they're pairs of the indexing set or pairs of an element in the indexing set and an element in the, the set that's being indexed. So in this interpretation, sigma behaves like a big disjoint union. I guess we, we fill in here. I kind of think that we mean. We take a big disjoint union over some indexing set P. Okay, so let's look at an example. Again, a proof. Uh, using sigma types. So one important uh, function that we use all the time is the kind of canonical projection function out of the sigma type. So if we have just an arbitrary uh, dependent type, we can produce a function that we usually call projection from the sigma type down to P, the indexing type. Okay, so how do we do this? So again, we're gonna kind of work backwards from the conclusion. Uh, so the conclusion that we want is again, some function like this. And we know that to produce a function, we have to Assume we have a proof for a term of the domain. And with that, produce uh, something in P here. Okay, and now, so that rule I want to say is the implication or function introduction rule. And now we're trying to uh, prove something about a sigma type or produce a, a function out of a sigma type basically. And so we're going to use the introduction, or sorry, the elimination rule for sigma types. Maybe I will copy and paste this so we can um, refer back to it. Okay, so we want to produce something out of a sigma type. Again, we're going to do some pattern matching. So we're comparing this thing that we want with this thing, the gamma again we see is going to be empty. Um, and the D of Z is again, just gonna be something rather simple, just going to be P in this case. Okay, so uh, we know what this hypothesis should be. It should just be that given something of this form. Again, I've used X twice. Maybe I can be a bit more careful and use Z here. Okay, so uh, the first hypothesis should just say that given the Z and the sigma type, we have the type P as a dependent type that we're looking at. And so that hypothesis is relatively straightforward. This one is the one that takes at least a little bit of work. And uh, so we're going to have to um, produce uh, such an A here for this hypothesis. Okay, so again, the gamma is just empty. There are no extra hypotheses that we need. And uh, we're looking at an inhabitant of P, an inhabitant of QX. So in some sense, we kind of split apart Z, and especially when you're um, doing programming here in Agda, you will get used to thinking about this as kind of splitting apart uh, the Z into the X and the Y, the two kind of components of the pair that we're thinking of Z as. Um, okay, so with the hypotheses X and Y, we need something in that dependent type, which here is just always going to be P. And we look at what we have there and we say, okay, it can just be X. We already know of a guy in P, so let's just take X. And now we can uh, write down exactly what this term should be here. This should be uh, in sigma. X, Z, and P, 
And now we want to uh, abstract this variable z from this term. And indeed, we now find this kind of projection function. And if we applied all the uh, computation rules, we would see that it behaves exactly as we set it up to behave. It takes, um, well, if we uh, apply this function to a pair, say p, q, it would produce p for us. It would produce that um, first index p. OK, so um, for the last section, I'm going to introduce the natural numbers. Uh, maybe I'll ask now if there are any questions before we go on to that. Maybe I'll just check with the TAs if they want to raise anything that people have uh, have asked about. No, I guess not. So please continue. Okay, great. All right. So now we're going to end with the um, maybe most interesting inductive type before we get to the identity type, which is the natural numbers. And uh, don't exactly know the history, but I would say maybe the word inductive comes from the fact that we can define the natural numbers this way and that uh, you will see that the um, what we mean by inductive type in the in the case of the natural numbers is really uh, mathematical induction that we might be used to. Okay, so we have the four rules as always. So first of all, we have the formation rule and this tells us that oops, that without any hypotheses, the natural numbers is a type. We also have the introduction rule, which tells us that without any hypotheses, zero is a natural number. So uh, people have different conventions, I guess, but usually in type theory, we always assume that the natural numbers start with zero. So zero is the first one. And if we have some natural number in hand, and perhaps we need some hypotheses to produce this natural number, then we have another one, the successor of n. So let me draw this out a little bit. What color should I use? Maybe blue. So uh, s of n, we should be thinking of as n plus 1 if you're not familiar with that notation. So we have 0. And for every natural number, we have the successor of that natural number, that natural number basically plus one. So this generates for us all the natural numbers, of course, right? Because we get zero, we get the successor of zero, which is one. We get the successor of the successor of zero, which is two, and so on and so forth. So we get all the natural numbers in that way. So these are all the canonical elements. And now uh, we can write down the elimination and the computation rule. So again, I would, um, for Charlie Wong, think about what those would be. They're actually a little bit more complicated in this case. Okay, so for the elimination rule, we again are considering a dependent type or predicate on the natural numbers. And we want to know how to produce a proof of, of this type for all natural numbers. Okay, so just like, uh, it's gonna be a little more complicated than usual, but basically just like all the other um, times we've done this, uh, Paige, I don't know if you can hear me, but uh, you're frozen and we can't hear you right now. I'll resume. Go ahead. Okay, just I'm gonna take a few seconds to connect. Yeah, sorry, I was too quick to go. restart. Okay, here we go. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, uh, right. So we're talking about the elimination rule. I don't know how much uh, everyone heard. So I was saying that just as before, we are starting at the top with a dependent type on the natural numbers. And we, what we want to conclude is that we have a proof of that dependent type or that predicate on all the natural numbers. 
And just as all the instances before, we are going to ask for this conclusion, we're going to ask that we have a proof uh, when we're considering the canonical elements. So for the first one, uh, the first canonical element zero, we want to ask that we have a proof of the type at zero. And for the second one, the successors, it's actually uh, more complicated and a bit more interesting. So, so the successor, this, um, this form of the, some of the canonical terms uh, depends on N. So it's not just a static canonical term or one that maybe depends on some kind of other static type, but it uh, is doing something kind of to N. It's taking in an argument from N, which is still being defined and producing another element. So the proof that we're gonna ask for here also has that flavor of turning something into something else. Okay, so with that um, explanation, let's actually see what it is. So uh, we're going to be looking at the successor of the natural number x. And just like the successor takes in a natural number and produces another one, we're going to assume that we have a proof of the uh, predicate, let's say, d at x. And we want to turn it into, we want to ask that we're able to turn it into a proof of D at the successor of X. Okay, so because there's this weird flavor that we haven't seen yet uh, in this canonical term that in which it takes in an argument of the, the type N that's still being defined and returns another uh, term, this, this proof here has a similar kind of flavor where we're, we are um, asking that we, if we already have a proof of the predicate at X, then we are somehow able to produce another proof of the predicate at S of X of the successor of X. Okay, so if we can do that, then we're good. And we can conclude that we have a proof everywhere. So A, B, X. Okay, and let me kind of explain this again and explain or try to explain that this is basically the same as the principle of mathematical induction that you might have seen if you've taken some math nice courses in college and undergraduate. Uh, okay, so let's think. So we, in the logical interpretation, at least we're, okay, we're interpreting the natural numbers of the set as usual. And we're gonna interpret D as a predicate on the natural numbers. Right? When we want to prove a predicate on the natural numbers, we usually invoke induction unless it's very trivial. Okay, and so induction, the principle of mathematical induction says, first of all, you have to supply a proof of the predicate at zero. You have to prove the base case, usually called. And if you have a proof of your statement at n, then you're able to turn it into a proof of your statement at n plus one. Okay, so that's exactly what these two guys are asking for. They're just asking for the ingredients of the principle of mathematical induction. And that it, what it returns is exactly what induction returns, which is uh, a proof that your statement holds at all natural numbers. Okay, so it's just the statement of mathematical induction. And hopefully that explains what the word induction is doing in all of these, these types. Okay, so uh, that's the elimination rule. And the computation rule is relatively similar to what we've had before. So again, uh, the computation rule, I'm not gonna write down the hypotheses because they're exactly the same as the hypotheses from the elimination rule. Uh, but the conclusions are slightly different. So if we plug in one of our canonical elements, we wanna get back the data that we started with. So if we plug in uh, zero, then this should be the same as the piece of data A that we started with. And if we plug in a successor, then we get back, so if we plug in a successor of X, then we get back um, our guy B, but uh, B here, so let me point out that B, I haven't written out explicitly, but it implicitly depends on the hypotheses X and Y. And so I want to replace y. So you see, I haven't assumed anything like y here. I want to replace y 
with what has been inductively generated, all these proofs that have been inductively generated. So this, um, the elimination rule inductively generates all these proofs of D of zero, D of one, D of two. So I want to consider as Y, the proof that's been generated um, for D of X, replace that with Y, and that should be, if we put that into uh, B, we do that replacement in B, we should get back exactly what's generated um, for the successor of X. Okay, so all of these, um, uh, these proofs match up with what we see supplied originally. Okay, and these both live in D of S of X. Okay, so let's look at some examples. I have 11 minutes left. So maybe let's, there are some more examples in the notes. So three examples, one very easy one, one very difficult for well, two similar ones. So let's do um, one of the, the second type. And again, I am going to copy our team. Hopefully it's interesting to see this in two different ways. Once in Agda and once on pen and paper. So we're going to produce a function add that takes in two natural numbers. So first this one and then this one and outputs the, the sum of them. Okay, so how do we do this? Of course, we do it in the same way that Martine did it, but it's gonna look a little bit different because it's on paper. Okay, so as usual, we want to produce a function from n to n to the n. So the first step is gonna be the same as it's always been. We're going to assume that we have a, something in n and we need to produce a term of the codomain n to n, okay? Um, and now we see, I'm following the pattern of really all the examples I've given, now we see that we are trying to produce a term of a type that's dependent on the natural numbers which we just defined. So we're gonna use the elimination uh, rule of this type. Okay, so we have to remember how to produce uh, such a function. Let me again uh, move this down so that we can refer back to it. So we're gonna be using the elimination rule is not cooperating with me. Let me just move it over here. Okay. So we're going to be using the elimination rule to produce such a thing. So we're going to be kind of pattern match. We are pattern matching this guy to this guy. We see again that the gamma is, is nothing in the gamma, it's just empty. And the D of X is always going to be N to N. And we need to produce um, these two guys. Okay, and actually I'm thinking now that I'm saying this, that we have two choices. We can do induction on N, as I've just been saying, by using N elimination and pattern matching this guy to this guy and thinking about which hypotheses we want to use. Or we can see again that we are trying to produce a function. Uh, so we could kind of um, go backwards using implication elimination or implication introduction again and uh, move this n over to this side and then do an induction on that end, which I think I'm going to do. I think, I'm gonna, I think that will be easier. Okay, so instead of using n elimination at this step, I'm going to use the implication introduction to move one of the ends over. And now all we're left with is producing a natural number, starting with these two hypotheses of two natural numbers. Okay, and now we're going to do induction on this end. So maybe if you're um, curious about why I'm doing this as an exercise, you could try to um, go the other route from, from this point and see, see how that works, which is possible, but um, not as clean as this one. Okay, so we're gonna do induction on this end. So we're gonna pattern match it to uh, this, this conclusion. So now the gamma is X and N. Unfortunately, the X's and the Y's don't match up perfectly, but this is, this gamma and this corresponds to this. And the D of X is always going to be the natural numbers. Okay? And we wanna produce this kind of guy. Okay, so we um, know what this hypothesis is gonna be. It's gonna be uh, X and N, Y and N, 
B dash or turnstile um, N. And the interesting ones that I think a little bit about are these two guys. Okay, so let's think about what we want in the first case. So the first argument that we need to supply is, oops, I want to differentiate gamma. So the gamma here is X and N. So we just have X and N. We're in the case where we're assuming that Y is zero and we're trying to define addition. So we want the result to be X plus zero basically. Right. And so we know what that should be. That should be X. So in this first uh, case, this first argument that we need, we're gonna supply X because that should be the result of adding X and zero. Okay, in the second case, so in this one here, we're going to, we have the gamma, which is X and N, then we have Y and N, and then we have um, the, what's written here as Y and DX. So I'm gonna say Z and DX, which is N. And we have to produce something in D of S of X, which is N. Okay, so what's happening here is we're assuming that we, uh, we already know the answer at X or at Y. The X's and the Y's are not matching up very well. So we're assuming that we know the answer at Y and using that information, we should produce the answer at the successor of Y. So if we know what X plus Y should be, then what should the successor of, or what should X plus the successor of Y be? It should be the successor of whatever X plus Y is, okay? So uh, here we want to define, as I said, the result of adding X plus the successor of Y in terms of the result of adding X plus Y, which uh, Z is standing in for. So that should be S of Z, the successor of Z. Okay, so those are our two arguments that we need to supply to N elimination. And now we can just use it. And we find that we have this term in N, X, S, Z, and I want a Y here in N. And now here, if you remember back to the beginning of this derivation, we are using implication uh, introduction. So we're gonna do the lambda abstraction to abstract out the Y. And we're doing it again to abstract out the X. Okay, and then we, maybe I can get this out. Bit more clearly, and then we find the, the function that we desired. And again, if we use the computation rules for the natural numbers and for implication or functions, we find that this does exactly what we, we designed it to. Okay, so I think I'll then just end with advertising uh, what we're gonna do next time. So this lecture has been, in some sense, uh, I would say technical and that we've just been introducing all these inductive types, seeing the pattern, doing examples, getting used to doing uh, proofs or maybe you could even say calculations in type theory. And that set us up now to uh, understand the most important and mysterious inductive type, which are um, identity types. Okay, and with that, then we'll finally be getting into the homotopical content of this course. So we'll finally be getting, we'll finally be graduating from type theory to homotopy type theory. Okay, that's it for me. Great, thank you very much, Paige. That was a wonderful introduction. And uh, let's see if, uh, well, first of all, let's see if there's any thanks. Okay, the chat is starting to fill with thanks. Um, are there any questions for Paige?
I think there was some questions about the the Z or the the Z in the the last line, uh, like where that comes from, because it's no longer in the in the context. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I suppose in some sense, I mean, it's an issue of how you write this. Yeah, so in some sense, we're kind of thinking maybe it's more appropriate to kind of think of uh, S here as a function that takes in Z and returns S of Z. So I guess it's just a, a choice of notation, but could have maybe instead written here S or maybe like lambda Z dot S Z or something here and here. Yeah, so um, yeah, so there, so S of Z is not really using a Z that's somehow been lost somewhere in the context and should still be there. It's really standing for this function that takes in a Z and returns an S of Z, which is, yeah. Uh, a bit, a bit confusing, probably. Good. Um, there's a question in the chat. Is there going to be a worksheet for today's lecture? Yes, my understanding is absolutely. And very um, exciting problem sessions that you should also go to. That's right. Problem sessions tomorrow, at the usual times. Uh, there's uh, someone with their hand raised. I will let them ask their question. All right, can you hear me? Yes, yep. please go ahead. Okay, uh, I was gonna ask, well, first before I ask my question, let me make sure that I understand. In this definition, are we doing induction on Y, like on the right element? Yeah, so it, yeah, in this exercise, we're doing induction here um, on this Y. So okay. here, I thought that in I this hypothesis, that, I yeah, that's perfect. So in this hypothesis, the Y disappears as a as a hypothesis because we're kind of plugging in in some sense zero for y and then we, we don't have to write anything down we're just assuming that y is zero so there's no like y to keep track of anymore and then here in the induction hypothesis or in the induction steps it's usually called like you usually assume that you um know the proposition at n the predicate at n you know that is true at n and then you want to prove it for n plus one so the n and the y here are playing the same rule so we're assuming that we um, know the predicate at n plus y, and then we're gonna prove it at the successor of n or yes. y. Okay, so I wanted to let you explain that just in case anybody else is wondering. But what my real question is, is I'm pretty sure in Agda, we defined induction on the left. No, not that that matters. I understand you can do either. But what I'm really wondering is how would this change if we wanted to do induction on left? Because it seems, I'm not induction on either. on the left on this guy you mean yes yeah good question okay so you can definitely do that and you can definitely um uh okay so there are different ways to do this there are tricks so one thing to do is that I mean if you using the rules that I gave if you want to do induction on x instead of y then you because the rule here only has extra hypotheses only has allowed extra hypotheses to the left of x, then we, we can't do um, this rule with the y here to the right of x. So it's not here. There's nothing like that here in this rule. So we have to have that y, uh, in a sense, living on the right of the turnstile, kind of uncurried on the right of the turnstile, so that the x here is in the right position to pattern match with this, this elimination rule. Uh, so that's a little bit tricky in the way that I've defined things. You could oh, okay. also define this rule in a slightly different way. Usually you see it in terms of the identity types. Maybe if people are a little bit advanced, they might have heard of Pauline boring identity types. You could define it slightly differently where you allow yourself to have extra hypotheses to the right of X. And that um, is interderivable as long as you have the um, dependent product types. Uh, so we could have a, a delta here. I suppose we want to have maybe a delta here and here. And so we could just give the rules in that way. And then we could easily do induction on X here if we wanted to, even though there's a Y to the right, because we've, we've, allowed, we've allowed that kind of thing to happen with our rules. Okay, and that's actually how it's introduced in, in the intro reference that you've, that you've mentioned multiple times. I think they use a gamut. Ah, okay, thanks. 
Yeah, I, I think also for this example, I mean, I guess, yeah, so you could do induction on X. It's kind of nice to completely um, unwind everything to have the, the two um, the two arguments, X and Y, explicitly mentioned here in the context. And yeah, I suppose it's, it's at that, in that situation then just as easy or it would basically be the same kind of proof to do induction on, on Y or on X, basically since addition is commutative. Uh, one last question. Could could you write down the two computation rules for the add function? Yeah, the, okay. The so, yeah. so for so do you want me to write the computation rules or do you want to go through the computation steps? I think just write down the two equalities that you the two definitional equalities that you have. Yeah, okay. So if we uh, let me copy and paste this. I mean, you have the name add given to this function, so you could just use use add okay. if you want. Good point. Okay, so if we do add, uh, let's say x y or x zero, I want to say, which is this guy applied to. Well, we're going to instantiate the x with x and the y with zero, then the computation rules tell us, okay, so let's trace through this whole thing. So the computation rules tell us, the computation rules for the natural numbers tell us that, that at this point, if we plug in zero to this function, so we plug in um, zero for y into this function, then we get back x that we started with. And then uh, when we move on here, for using implication. So the implication computation rule tell us that we, if we plug in kind of the same thing, if we plug in um, a, sorry, if we plug in a zero here, then we get, sorry, let me start over. What am I saying? Okay, I wanted to point at this guy when I said the natural number um, computation rule. So the natural number computation rule says that if we plug in a zero for y into this guy, we get back the x that we started with. Then the implication computation rule here says that if we same thing, if we plug in a zero for y into this function now, we get back um, the x. And the computation rule for implication again tells us that if we plug in some arbitrary x and zero for y, we get back x. So this guy is x. And now if we want to add x and the successor of y, which is this whole thing, add x and the successor of y, then the computation rule, the second line in the computation rule for the natural numbers tells us that what we get back here is exactly this, which is to say it's the successor of the result of adding uh, x and y. And then the computation rules for the implication rules just kind of carry that through. So the result is exactly the successor of, oops, let me write the name of the function, the successor of adding X and Y. And that's what we expect. Great. And these are definitional qualities. Yes, yes exactly. Let me write the, the notation that I've been using. Okay. Um, I think that's a great point to stop. Um, so as I mentioned, we have the problem sessions tomorrow and the next lecture is on Monday. It's Paige again, doing the third lecture in the homotopy type theory stream. So I hope to see you then. Yep. Thank